Good morning, everybody. It is so good to have you here at Heaven's Point of View. I am here every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. And so today is a little bit different, but we are glad that you have tuned in with us. And uh, I've been hinting for several weeks that I was going to have a special guest. And I have my special guest, as you can see. Say hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so today we have Marianne Peluso McGahan. Am I pronouncing that right? That is perfect. Good. And uh, so we have her with us today. But before we let her, um, you know, jump into her testimony, I want to remind you guys, go out and check out our website, hopecreationsbybj.com and check out all the um, products that we have. We are adding new products for the Christmas season. So you want to do all your Christmas shopping, get it done ahead of time. You can have it. You don't have to worry about it. And you can just sit down and eat, drink hot cocoa and eat cookies, you know, for the rest of the season. <laughs> that, that's my idea of having a great Christmas. So go out and check out um, hopecreationsbybj.com. Um, our retreat for next year is October 5th through 7th, and I will be making an announcement about that next program. So the next Tuesday, you're going to hear the announcement that you've been waiting for concerning our retreat October 5th through 7th. You don't want to miss that announcement. It's going to blow your mind because it has definitely blown mine. <laughs> when God gets in stuff, it's just like, wow, okay, Lord. <laughs> so check that out. If you'd like to get in contact with us, just reach us at uh, P.O. Box 1833 in Slidell, Louisiana, and we will get right back to you. So we are going to get right into our program today. As I said, we have Marianne Peluso McGahan, and they are, um, McGahan is your husband's last name, so it's McGahan Peluso Ministries, right? Yes. And I have that uh, link to their website linked below, so just look at that and type it out, get it now, so that if it disappears off the screen, you already have it. Go and check their website out. Um and if you just look up Marianne Peluso on Google, she's going to pop up. And I know many of you have probably seen her on some of the classic crusade videos on SBN. So let's get into it. Miss Marianne, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to have you on my program. BJ, it is my honor. I've been excited ever since you asked me and uh yeah i feel like a classic card you know those classic crusades <laughs> no oh, Lord, but that's okay you know i i i cherish and um and kind of savor you know when you have a good meal and you can still taste it in your mouth i savor and can still taste those times with brother swaggered in the classic crusades back in the 80s and 90s I still cherish those memories, and and uh, you're part of it. Uh, I feel like we're in a like a, a heavenly alumni. Uh, <laughs> and we've talked about getting together and doing something. We've got to we've got to get all of us past present uh, 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 singers uh, together and do something uh, Gaither style. Just sit around and talking and, <sighs> and and ministry. I think that would minister to us and the people. But I just want to say thank you for the honor of being here. I never take for granted an open door to uh, give witness and testimony and lift up and give center stage to Jesus. And I just want to encourage you, BJ, and what you're doing here. Do not despise small beginnings, says the Lord. For great is your reward, and you will be rewarded not only in heaven, but on earth. God is going to give you favor with man. You have favor with God. The word says that Jesus had favor with God and man. And so I want to just say that, get that out there to you. Not because I'm just on the program, but I believe that your diligence and your faithfulness uh, is going to rise. Uh, you think God has used you in the past or even now where you are. Mm -hmm. Girl, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wow. And 
it kind of segues into my testimony. A lot of people have seen me singing and, and um, worshiping the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times the tears flow like all of us. You've been there and other singers, psalmists. And those tears flow out of gratitude and a, uh, a keen sense of uh, not a beaten down, oh, poor, poor worm of a sinner I am, but really... I deserve to be burning right now. I was raised in a Christian home, a uh, wonderful uh, AG church, Assembly of God. Not typical for being a full-blooded Italian. My <laughs> grandparents left the Catholic church, oh, wow. got born again in spirit filled, got disowned from the family because they were Roman Catholic. But eventually the family <laughs> came in. And the family, eventually the family came in and uh, I was raised in a wonderful, traditional uh, Pentecostal home. And I'm so glad because it took that power in my mom and dad's life to instill in me the knowledge of that. The unfortunate thing was I thought I knew God, re being raised in it. And I got out in the world. I loved to sing. And the peer pressure back when I was growing up um, was uh, whatever the magazines, you know, the back then, PJ, I mean, there weren't ethnic Barbie dolls. <laughs> I mean, the Barbie dolls that I had played with had blonde, long, straight hair and oh, straight yeah. hips, girl. I mean, yes. you know, I've got black curly hair. Thank God for, you know, uh, blow dryers. But I mean, I had this curly, curly Italian kinky hair. I uh, was raised on the ocean in San Diego. Wow. Everybody had blonde hair and tan and, and I did not fit the mm. mold. Mm -hmm. And that put me under pressure. And I simultaneously I, I had this great desire to sing and when I sang at school uh, I could fit in and people liked me and that took me down a dark road I told my mom at 16 I don't want to go to church anymore you can't make me there was a youth pastor that had made an inappropriate uh, advance toward me and mm -hmm. that put a seed in my heart that they were all hypocrites but I look back now that's an excuse so if you're sitting there today and you're harboring any unforgiveness or you're thinking, mm -hmm. you know, Christians are hypocrites or that person, don't let bitterness or unforgiveness stop you. It did me. And it was an excuse for me to get out in the world. And by the time I was 28, my, uh, 25, my father was my best friend. And we were raised poor, seven kids. He had a job that uh, brought him money one time a year. And that was pyrotechnics. And he was a fireworks display. Uh, mm -hmm. It was handed down through tradition. I knew he was going out of town that weekend. I had signed with a group. Uh, we, were, we were our first project with Warner Brothers. I gradually made uh, the move up going from San Diego to Los Angeles, got introduced to people, and I was obsessed with being a, a famous rock and roll singer. Blues, blues rock. But my obsession was to be famous. I was so beat down from the, uh, I was tall and skinny and gawky and homely growing up. I mean, I just have to admit it. So I was trying to get the applause of the world. And if people would just love me, mm -hmm. I couldn't be pretty so I could sing. So I was obsessed if I could just be a famous singer. And that in 1980, uh, my father was going away one weekend. I had finally met some people that could take me there. Uh, with one band I was signed, we were signed with Warner Brothers. With another band, I had met the guy was the brother of uh, the Doobie Brothers, with the guy in the Doobie Brothers. And uh, so meeting these people, I was getting closer to this. If I could just have the love of the world, then this ache and this hurt and this need to be loved would go away. I didn't realize it was Jesus that I was running from and that I needed. Yes. And my mom, my mom, I couldn't stand my mom. She was wonderful, loving, not a controlling, loud Pentecostal, but she was so close to the Lord. When I got <laughs> in her presence, I was convicted. But my dad was my life. He was my world. And he gave his life to the Lord, but not as radical as my mom. So one night, um, as I was in Los Angeles, I got a call and the guy said, you know, we've been watching you. Can you get up here? We need to talk to you. I drove up. It was two hours from San Diego. I was living in Los Angeles, but my father was going to be going away for the weekend, 
doing something explosive like special effects somewhere. And I, I drove from LA to be with him that weekend. It was the 25th of May, 1980. Mm -hmm. And I, said my goodbye he got up early the next morning i stayed at my mom and dad's house and i just love that man so much mm -hmm. my dream was to just provide for him he worked so hard and he was starting to age and so i w drove up to los angeles and uh i looked at the clock when we were negotiating it was 2 25 in the morning i just happened to look at this clock and when i got up there these guys that i had been looking up to and partying with by then i had a probably a $5,000 a day cocaine habit. Wow. Uh, our yeah. producers and our promoters, they made sure that we stay on this wheel of concerts. And, and so they gave us free, everything was free cocaine. And then at night, PJ, we needed to, if we needed to sleep, they had doctors that gave us, I was taking horse tranquilizers, quaaludes. Wow. To relax. Wow. I smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. I was just this wild woman. When I got saved, I threw my clothes in the trash can. I didn't give them the goodwill because they weren't fit for anyone. I mean, the radical change oh my I in my life. Wow. But my mom was praying for me. And unbeknownst to me, she said the last time she prayed for me, she was not an emotional Italian. She was very reserved, but she said she had a, a vision. She went into prayer and she prayed every every morning at three in the morning she'd slip out of bed till she passed away at nine 99 this wow. she said it was like a, a movie screen dropped out of the sky while she was praying on her knees and looked and she watched this movie of a lamb in the middle of a forest at midnight and there were a pack of wolves taking this lamb one bite at a time slowly it was being eaten alive she said an audible voice came into the room and said, that's Marianne. Wow. And she said, I pray God, whatever it takes, bring her in. And she said later, don't pray that unless you're willing to really. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, I'm sitting and negotiating. And they said, we've been watching you. And these guys were major promoters and executives for rock bands in Los Angeles. I would finally made it up. You know, the devil has favor too. Oh, yeah. Right. So oh, yes. I'm sitting there and they said, we've been watching you and we would like to get you out of your contract that you have with this other band. We were doing our first project, Warner Brothers. I thought that was great. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and all my dreams coming true. You know, the devil will give you whatever you want if it take, can take you away from God. Absolutely. That's why anymore, I'm not impressed how big it is. Mm -hmm. If God's not in it, I don't want it. So they said, we've been watching you and we really like what we see. We like what we hear. And every song I sang back then, I'm, I mean, I've always had this gravelly, you know, Rod Stewart type, you know, if I sang a Donna Summer song back then, it was... Donna, Sir, Donna Summer with a Rod Stewart, you know, gravel. <laughs> I couldn't get rid yeah. of that gravel, but they liked that. So they said, we've been watching you. We want you out of this contract. We've got our lawyers. You can start next week on the road opening for, with us. It was a band for the Doobie Brothers. Wow. And they quoted me a, a price. And I thought, this is it. I mean, this does not happen. I know people in, that have been in music for years that are working their way to talk, and then they fall back down, up and down. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, I must be really good. Little did I realize it was the enemy keeping mm -hmm. me from God's destiny to take me to hell. Mm -hmm. So I woke up the next day. Well, I looked at the clock, and it said 2.25. I got up the afternoon. I drove back to San Diego. I couldn't wait to tell my dad. I can't wait to tell him all, his, all my dreams come true, but it came true, but even more he can rest. I'm going to provide for him. We were so poor. He was an orphan with a sixth grade education, had wow. seven kids. They'd gone. My mom had a new, knew how to make pasta every, you know, pasta with this, <laughs> a pasta with that. There are eight of us, yeah. so I totally understand. <laughs> yes, it's like an economical beans with this or being, you know, the Hispanics or whatever. So I drove back to tell him I couldn't wait. Mm -hmm. This was a for sure thing. I drove up to my parents' home. And all I saw the uh, the cars. It was Sunday afternoon, uh, a typical Italian tradition. And my P 
parents kept the tradition, even though they were first generation, I'm second. Every Sunday you had a big, everybody came over for spaghetti meatballs. That was just it. And so I drove up, it was Sunday. I saw my brothers and sisters' cars. I didn't think anything of it. But when I got out of my car, my brother Salvatore was sitting on the steps of my parents' home. And I have four Italian stallion, like Rocky type brothers. Yo, they don't show emotion. They're not huggy. I walk, got to the step and he stood up and he held me and he said, Marianne, dad's dead. I walked into the house and I heard something in my mind. I could hear something, someone saying something like he got killed by a drunk driver. I walk in and I see my mom on the couch being consoled by all the women from the church. And out of her mouth comes this, I'm in God's hands. I've never gone through a crisis, but what God has brought good out of it, had it never happened. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I walked in the corner of her house. I looked at the ceiling. I shook my fist at God. I said, I don't know what kind of God of love you are, but you took the most important thing in my life. And after that, the roadies came over. One of our roadies were, got out, came over in his gold Jaguar and said, took me away and said, here, uh, have a drink. Time heals all wounds. Uh, someone else came over with a line of cocaine and said, hey, you know, we're really sorry if this makes you feel good. And all day long, the counsel and the consolation and the consolation of the world was right before me. And that night when the moon came out and the stars were bright and everyone went to sleep, my world stopped. I was in my parents' home. I was laying on the bed. Uh, the, the shock wore off and I'm, I'm having a breakdown. I was kicking the room, twisting the covers. The most in my life, BJ, he was my life. He was my everything, my best friend. And when it hit me, I thought, you know what? Then. I try to console myself with the contract in Hollywood and fame and fortune. And it, it didn't work any other time there was a pit, but this pit, David said, you brought me out of a horrible pit. And I laid there and in the middle of a breakdown. And I said, I have two alternatives, a insane asylum, I'll end up in a mental institution or a suicide. I had too much pride to think of being in an institution and people walking by and going, there's Marianne, she wigged out. So I thought, well, you know, our, our drummer was the West Coast, no kidding, West Coast drug connection for all the rock bands. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had heroin, he had cocaine. He brought mm -hmm. up the runners from Columbia. I'd meet him and next thing I'd hear, they got killed. I mean, it was crazy. So I thought, you know, I've never done heroin. I knew that if I did, I would get hooked. I thought, well, I'll make a connection. I'll pump my veins full. Nothing mattered, BJ. Nothing mattered. You might be out there today say, nothing matters anymore. Everywhere I turn, I keep bumping my head into failure. But I want to tell you today, don't give up. And I laid there and I thought, okay, I'll get up and go make my connection. Nothing matters. I was laying on the bed, and when I put my feet on the floor of that home, my parents' home, all of a sudden, this Jesus walked through the wall. You know, he's still walking through walls. This presence came into the room like he walked through the wall. And mm -hmm. I didn't see him with my physical eyes, BJ, mm -hmm. but he was there, and he stood before me. And he said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And what can you give in exchange? And I said, Jesus, I've heard about you all my life, but mm -hmm. you're way out there. I said, long story short, I said, you know, my life doesn't matter to me anymore. And uh, BJ, this is my point I want to hit on. I'm so glad that I was raised in a time where the gospel, like what we hear at JSM, it's black and white. There is no offense. When you give your life to Jesus, you let go of the world. Uh, you've got to let go of everything. Uh, don't build a house and get halfway through. So I told God, leave me alone because the Holy Spirit would convict me. I'd, I'd be up from the cocaine. I'd take that quaalude, that horse tranquilizer. And right when I get sleepy and my head would hit the pillow, mm -hmm. my eyes would pop wide open and the Holy Spirit would deal with me and yeah. say, I need you 
you're not doing, I have a call on your life. I love you. It was my mom's prayers. Thank God for a praying mom. You know, my mom did the same for us. You know, she prayed us all through. And my brothers had a similar situation to where they were about to sign a contract that would have destroyed their lives. And she prayed through, they got into an argument and the guy said, forget this. I, we don't want to deal with this and kicked them all out the office. And all of them are now pastors. Wow. Thank so, you, Lord. Thank God. you, God. That didn't... Mom. Yes, for mama's prayers. And I tell you, I, 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 so I having this all like telepathy, you know, and I said, God, if you can, you can have my life, you can send me to Timbuktu, you can tell me to do whatever, because my life don't matter. And so I don't care what people think anymore. You do. And I stretched out my laid back and stretched out my arms on the bed. And all of a sudden, BJ, it felt like a, this huge boulder was lifted off my back. Literally, I felt something leave my back. And it took me back. I was just pulling for straws. I had tried relationships, drugs. I tried everything. Wow. This was the last thing I, because I told God, I'm never going to give my life to you unless I go all the way. I couldn't, I'd be sitting around with these rock stars and they'd say, what do you think that the, the uh, meaning of life is and what is truth? And my lips were closed because I wasn't going to back it up with my life. So I thought I'd shut up. Wow. And so as I lay there and this load lifted, all of a sudden I went, oh, he's real. Jesus became real to me. He was real. I spent the rest of the night weeping and crying all of the times that I pushed God away when those prayers of my mom would be broken out. I'd say, go away, God, when I'm 60 or 70, you know, I'll, <laughs> oh, that'd be like right now. Hello. Um, I said, no, go away, go away. And I spent the evening crying, thinking, and this is the bottom line, I should have been burning in hell. That drunk driver that killed my dad going 100 miles an hour, it was 2.20 in the morning, at same 25, same time I looked at the coroner's report. He was going through Los Angeles from San Francisco to go to San Diego, and LA's in the middle. He didn't want to go through LA during rush hour during the day, so he went in the middle of the night, and this guy came out 100 mm -hmm. miles an hour. He had explosives he never detonated. It killed him immediately, killed the other guy. And I lay there and thought that could have been me. I took that same freeway so many times. And then the gratitude and I wept. I spent the rest of the, and I haven't stopped weeping since that I should be what I deserve. I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve any glory, any fame, any applause, anything. I owe it all to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this is it. The next morning I woke up. I told my mom, don't ever talk to me about Jesus. I don't want to hear it. 16 mm -hmm. years old. You can't make me go to church. She was in the kitchen, had her apron on, stirring the spaghetti sauce. And I came up. I didn't know her. I didn't like her. I didn't like to be around. I said, Ma. She turned around. I said, I gave my life to Jesus. She threw her hands in the air. And she said that his death was not in vain. Don't you understand? Your father was ready to meet God. You wouldn't have been. Wow. And we spent the rest of the time. I mm -hmm. found out later that he was diagnosed with cancer. We didn't know it. She said, see, the Lord knew I couldn't take that. He was killed immediately. Uh, and I miraculously got out of a contract with the other group. And I'll tell you what, I, I got saved, sat in a Assembly of God church. I didn't do anything for a year. I just sat, um, finally gave my testimony after a year. And the secret, I think, to any ministry is that first love. You know, yeah. everything comes out of seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything is added. Absolutely. See, a lot of people think that they have to have some miraculous, you know, testimony to be used of God. And your mother was used of God probably more than the two of us put together because oh. she prayed you through. And because of that, you have been able to reach who knows how many people with the gospel, both through song and through your testimony and through your ministry. And my mom prayed me and my brothers and sisters through all eight of her children are ministers. And so, and wow. it's only because of the grace of God and her oh, prayers. Wow. Exactly. And so she was used probably more than we have 
put together because they chose to get down on their knees and to pray for their children and to Absolutely. pray them through. And Absolutely. that is such a powerful thing. And I know there's a lot of you all out there, you feel like, well, I'm up in age, there's nothing I can do. Pray. Because that prayer is what has Marianne doing what she's doing and has me doing what I'm doing. It's it's a miraculous, beautiful thing. So share how you went from, you know, singing rock and roll to singing the gospel. How did the Lord bring that into your life? Well, I was uh, go- attending an Assembly of God church. It was a large one that my mom went to. And on Thursday mornings, the, the WM groups, so, you know, the older ladies would gather. And uh, my mom, the, the head of the WM said, Marianne, you know, it's been a while. You've been sitting down now and, and we understand you don't want to sing. You just want to sit. Um, but would you, could you sing a song? Bring us a song next week. And I'm like, oh, man, I didn't know any songs. I'm thinking, <laughs> well, all I know is the old standards, you know. Uh, Andre mm-hmm. Crouch wasn't even out when I was growing up. There was just no, you know, contemporary music. or anything. So I went to the Christian bookstore and I found a track for Those Tears I Died. And one Thursday, I got my little tape recorder and I stood up there and I gave my testimony and sang. And I thought that was it. Well, the wife of the pastor of this large Assembly of God church in San Diego was in the meeting and she said to her husband, you know, Richard is saying, Richard, you need we need to have Marianne sing. She's singing the WMs. So they contact the music director and I sang there and and um the people that went, then I began to sing, you know, on Sundays, join the choir. And there were uh, people from the full gospel businessmen meeting that attended the church. Then they asked me to sing at their meeting. And then little by little, the network grew. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I began to travel in 1983. I went full time. And uh, when I was single and uh, traveling, you know, just doing, I was doing this great, great doors opening up through that testimony in that little WMs. And one day I got the Pentecostal evangelist um, or the evangelist from Jimmy Swire Ministries. Cause I was like, I would, I mean, I was like addicted every Sunday night. I was listening to that because nobody else. I'm like, that's God speaking. And there were so many mamby pamby. I just wanted power. Cont- contemporary mm-hmm. stuff was coming. It was mm-hmm. pure power. And I saw an advertisement for a singles conference. And I, you know, read it and put it away. And I thought, I ain't. And the Holy Spirit said, get it back out. I want you to go to that singles conference. I thought, I ain't looking for no husband. I'm not going to no singles <laughs> conference, Lord. That's I, great. Got <laughs> and I got it up and I said, okay, I signed up for it. And before that, I had met some of the singers that came to Los Angeles through a friend. Wes Murray was on the, uh, he's passed now. Uh, and Janet and John and all of them were there. And I went back, back back there and because of Wes Murray and met him. And I thought, that's it. That's the end of it. Well, so I, I went to the singles conference and they asked, Wes said, you're singing for the conference. I was like, wow. They, okay. This is what you were talking about. The Lord, because when I would watch the telecast, the Holy Spirit said, one day you'll be a, a soloist and a background singer. And I mean, I'm like, I shared that with one person. They're going, yeah, right, right. And, you know, <laughs> and, you know, Hawaii has got snow today. It's just so sure enough. They asked me to sing. Brother Rents was in the meeting at the mm-hmm. singles uh, conference on a Saturday night banquet. Mm-hmm. And we were at Thomas Sloan's house the next day. I was with the singers and I thought I was in heaven. Got a call. Thomas got a call and said, Marianne, you're singing tonight. Brother Swagger uh, heard that mm-hmm. you were singing and uh, sang uh, that evening, ministered that evening, and the Spirit of God fell, and they asked me if I would come and be a part of the team, and so that was in 1986. And that's that's the beautiful thing about the difference between trying to promote yourself, yes, and promoting God, yes. because when you try to promote yourself, things go crazy. You, it's it's chaos. But when God does it, He does it in His perfect time in his perfect order. And he, he puts us in a place of position, but it's not about us. And when it becomes about us, what happens? He removes us from these different places. And so um, I saw your heart, even back then in 86, I was in um, 
getting ready to graduate high school. And a few years later in 88, I came looking for you. She was, oh, I was like, no, I wanted to meet her. <laughs> but the Lord did give us that opportunity to meet years later, which yeah. has been awesome. Um, but, you know, the, the Lord does things perfectly in, in his time. And when you were there, you ministered to the people in tremendous ways. I still hear people mention your name and, and the music, how it touched them and how uh, honest your music was just the way you sang it, the honesty just poured out and you could tell it was from your heart. It wasn't, I'm, I'm a big star and I'm traveling the world, you know, and, and the Lord gave you those opportunities. I mean, in your bio, it says you've traveled to what, 30 something nations. And, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. A lot. but it was for him, you know, and it was all about him. I want to, play a clip real quick just so they can get a little quick taste of your voice Oh, it doesn't want to play on me. Oh, okay. Well, we're going to show it another time. Yeah, that's <laughs> but that right. is just beautiful, you know, and, and how God used you during that time. And he hadn't stopped. Um, I know that you are still doing some traveling and, and ministry through television, programs, podcasts, radio, <laughs> a little bit of everything. Huh? Share a little bit on that. Well, it's it's ironic. The name of your the name of this program is Point View. Heaven's Point of View. Heaven's Point of View. I co-hosted um, up until recently. I hosted a, a television program called God's View uh, okay. with four other <laughs> ladies. So you know, God wants His view getting out there. That's for Absolutely. sure. But yes, I've had the honor, and um, uh, I pulled back for several years. I was caretaking my mom until she passed and uh, recently have been uh, back out there. I'll be in Branson, let me see, this month. Uh, uh, and so God is opening the doors. But I tell you, I've really been in a place of uh, being content with, uh, like you said about your mom and my mom, uh, mm -hmm. for those watching, listening, Listen, the most important parts of the body are the ones you can't see. Mm. I am learning, and I learned this from Brother Wilkerson, that God gave me the extreme honor of getting close to. He said, remember, Marianne, it's not what you're doing for Christ that matters. It's what you're becoming. Mm. So I want to encourage everyone. So what, um, I, what I'm doing now is uh, a lot of intercessory prayer. I'm heading up a prayer uh, a prayer network uh, through uh, a ministry called Battle Ready Ministries. And I just, whatever the Lord drops in my lap, I'll do. Um, it's not out there as much, but I'm so content. And I, I just want to share real quick with those listening. Um, you know, when Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, and that says he got his eyes off of Jesus. And here's Jesus in the water above on top of the water. And he picks Peter up out of the water. That was a miracle right there. But he puts him back in the boat. So they're back in the boat. And in the original where it says, Jesus said to Peter, he rebuked him sternly, the word says. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, ye of little faith. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why did you? And I, I said to the Lord, he said, Lord, that was pretty strong in the original. It says you were stern with him. You were upset. You were angry with him. I'll just say it like that. Yeah, yeah. I said, Lord, why would, you know, you're such a loving God. Why would that upset you so much? He said, because of this, he said, it's not, and this has been burned in me. He said, it's not how you start out that matters. It's how you finish. And I mean, all the scriptures of finishing well and those who overcome will en enter heaven. I want to encourage everyone out there today, and even you, BJ, you know, 
stay strong. If God's not looking, you may have done great things 40 years ago, 20 years ago. God is looking out right now. Mm-hmm. Where are we? Are we pressing in? Are we uh, 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 just being faithful wherever he puts us? Right, right. That's beautiful. And I mean, it's so important. Um, I was at a, <clears throat> excuse me, a women's conference this last weekend. And one of the sessions was about not losing your taste for mm-hmm. ministry. And there was a woman there who mentioned how, you know, she had stepped back from ministry because it had hurt her so much. And so we have to finish well. Thank you yes. for that word. I really appreciate it. I would like for you to, in our program this morning, speaking to those both who were you and those that are your mother, those that have been, you know, going through the drugs and and dealing with the world and wanting, you know, the fame and all these things. And then, you know, speak to those mothers who have been praying for those same children that they can be encouraged that, Prayer works. Amen. And I'd, I'd be honored to, first of all, for those of you that are out there and you're running from God, you're trying to satisfy both worlds, or maybe you came mm-hmm. upon this podcast, this broadcast uh, by accident. There are no accidents, <laughs> but you're searching, you're trying to fill that void, that God void that only He can fill with relationships and you keep hitting your head against the wall, nothing is going to fulfill. Nothing is going to make sense in your life until you fully yield your heart. And you might say, well, that's easy for you to say, Marianne, you don't know where I am. You don't know the tangle, the mess I'm in. I do. And I want to tell you, you open your heart and you just say, God doesn't need a lot. He doesn't need He just needs your heart. He needs your will. He Mm -hmm. needs you to say, Jesus, okay, I give up. Take, take this mess and bring a message out of it. And, and you do that right now, wherever you are, just say, Jesus, I give up. I quit running. Mm -hmm. Come and fill that void in my heart that was created only for you. Forgive me for trying to use something and someone else. Thank you. Uh, Just a little seed, just a little bit. He's going to open that up for you and he's going to untangle. Someone's in a real mess. I don't know if it's a legal mess, an abusive uh, marriage, an abusive situation. You are in a mess that in the natural cannot get untangled. I'm telling you, God is supernatural. You step towards him. He's going to step towards you. He said, you come to me, you seek me and you will find me. He's going to untangle that mess. And for those mothers, those siblings, those aunts, uncles, grandparents that are praying, don't give up. Don't, no matter what you see. My mom shook her fist one day at the devil and she quoted Acts 16, 31. And this is what you do today where Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy household. And <laughs> Amen. she says, that's my promise. Now there. So you believe that. Quote Amen. the word to the devil Amen. and God will come through. Amen. Go ahead and close us out in prayer. That was okay. beautiful. Father, we thank you, God. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, today. I thank you for BJ. I thank you, God, for this audience. I thank you, God, for everyone watching right now. Lord, I ask for a manifestation of your presence and power to come in to those listening, Lord, that would heal, that would deliver, that would provide, God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you are a very present help in time of need. And Lord, right now, you're meeting every need as we look to you, as we seek you first and your kingdom, your will. All these other things will be added. I thank you, God, right now for the prodigals coming home. I thank you for the finances that are being released right now and the healings of the bodies and the minds right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. I so appreciate you coming and sharing. I know that what you had to say is definitely going to minister to many, many people who listen. So thank you. Before I let you go, though, you have to tell us about that beautiful glass behind you. Oh, 
It's so gorgeous. And I've seen some of his, your husband's videos of him creating oh. some of these beautiful pieces. Yeah. And uh, tell us a few seconds. I know we're okay. running we run out of time. Okay. But. <laughs> Real quick, my husband that God, my mom prayed for a husband and it was him. Uh, and he happens to be a glass blower. Uh, what he does in glass blowing used to be when they first started out, they would break a few things learning. Not so much anymore, but they do trim goblets. Oh my goodness. I could show you. Uh, let me see. It's probably the, I uh, got it. Anyway, they make gorgeous things. We have a gallery here. Beautiful. And um, so when they're glass, when they're making glass, sometimes they have accidents, but there was a time, sorry, when um, he was, they would have these beautiful pieces that would fall to the ground and they would put in a bucket and then dump them. One day his son came to him and said, dad, isn't there something we could do with all these broken pieces? And he said, no, son, they, that wouldn't be possible. Make a long story short. They worked at it and they ended up perfecting what they call Redento Raffinados. That means redeemed elegance. It's oh, symbolic how, of how God takes the broken pieces of our heart, wow. of our lives, and makes beautiful things out of them. And these vases behind me, they command, uh, they're, they're, they're very expensive. But the point is, after the pieces are broken and put back together, they're more valuable than with them when they were in their perfect condition. So you can encourage today. Oh my gosh, that is the most beautiful. I, I didn't know that part about the glass. That that brings tears to my eyes. It just, I mean, that's that's how God does with us, man. Wow, that's that's powerful. And I know that you must use that as part of your ministry because you can't miss it. That's that's awesome. Yes. I've never heard that before. Yes, world leaders, wow. movie stars, we're able to minister that message with every waist. Wow. We just had a famous singer get one. If I said her name, everyone would know it. And the <laughs> Lord said, you keep that message center and I'll bless it. That is beautiful. One day I'm going to get out there and see the gallery. Yes, you are. I yes. am. I would love to. We'd love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. And thank you guys for joining us again. Um, every week, y'all are so faithful coming out and supporting by watching. And I appreciate it. Please share the program um, with your friends, family, in your groups, and let them hear this message. This is a powerful message that can, you might be the one that when you share this video, you can save somebody from entering hell. It's just as plain as that. This may be their day when they re listen to this program. So make sure you're sharing it. And don't forget, go out to their website. It's right there at the bottom of the screen, www.mcgahanpalusoministries.com. You can take a peek at some of the glass that they have and, and just get a little bit more about them and uh, search her on YouTube. She's got some beautiful music out there. We love you. I will see you next week. Tuesday, 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. And until then, be sure to tell somebody that Jesus loves them, okay? I love you guys. See y'all next week. Bye-bye.